I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The University of Minnesota Board of Regents met in Duluth today with an agenda heavy with items important to northeastern Minnesota. Minnesota's newest Supreme Court judge made history becoming the first Native American on the state's highest court. We have a profile of Judge Anne McKeague. And we'll have the week's business headlines and a news file story from 25 years ago. It's all up next on Almanac North. Welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, it's good to be back in studio after a few weeks away during the Public TV March membership drive. I have to admit, it was also kind of nice to be out of studio on a Friday night for <laughs> a couple of weeks, enough. too. It's been a working on a Friday night. The membership drive was very successful. Was. Thank you to everyone who yeah, called in. We absolutely. appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And our first guests are standing by. All right. Thank you, Denny. Welcome, everyone. When the University of Minnesota Duluth Board of Minnesota Board of Regents met at UMD this morning, it marked the first time they had gathered outside the Twin Cities since 2008. The Regents had a chance to tour university facilities in Duluth and Cloquet and heard firsthand from faculty and staff about successful programs and needs. Well, joining us to talk more about the board and its meeting in Duluth is Dave McMillan, U of M Regent representing the 8th Congressional District. And Lenley Lynn Black is the Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Duluth. And welcome to both of you. Good evening. Hello. Dave, nice let, to have you. let's start with you. Um, what's the value of bringing the board up to Duluth to tour the UMD campus? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of values, and I'll, I'll just highlight a couple. And uh -huh. uh, most importantly, it's an opportunity for the board to uh, experience firsthand you know, the size and scope and breadth of the mission of the state's land-grant university. And uh, I per, I'm a little biased, but I don't think there's too many places where that's better reflected than right here. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost a quarter of our undergraduate students here at UMD, and uh, they get a chance to touch and feel and interact with all that. To Otherwise, we see that from 160 miles south. We all know it's here, but uh, getting mm -hmm. up here now yeah. and is really important. Mm -hmm. Chancellor, what message did you try to get across for the Board of Regents? Well, there are many. We, first of all, wanted to make sure that we showcased UMD in a significant way. And, and you did. And we did. <laughs> uh, quite successful. Our faculty and, and students and staff did a wonderful job. We had a number of sessions that featured faculty research and faculty student collaborations. So that's part of it. Another part of it is helping to demonstrate how important we are to the system and how we are both very much a part of the University of Minnesota but also very distinctive. Uh, our campus, our focus is different than the other campuses, uh, and we have a significance that uh, we think is, is critical, and we wanted the board to understand that more, more fully. Mm -hmm. Chancellor, were there any specific issues that related to Duluth or Northeastern Minnesota that you really wanted to, to talk about with the regions? Well, one of the things we spent some time on this morning uh, at, at the Board of Regents meeting uh, Two of my colleagues and I did a presentation on engagement and how UMD is, is uh, engaged and involved in the Duluth Twin Ports community and also throughout the Northland. And that was, this was something the Board of Regents asked us to do. They wanted to get a sense of our community involvement. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was one of the primary themes that we, that we pursued. Mm -hmm. You mentioned engagement, and of course, you've been active in the, the private sector in town for a long yeah. time with Minnesota Power. As a, a business person, do you see the university pretty engaged with the business community and trying to make sure that the graduates who are coming out are really in sync with the needs? I really do, Julie, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to commend Chancellor Black. When he first got here, it preceded my time on the board of re I was elected in 2011, my first term. And uh, Chancellor Black got here shortly before that, and I think he really set a model for how to go out, reach out into the community. He was a newcomer at the time, 
and, and engage the businesses, the neighborhoods, the communities, and uh, really some of the key economic drivers in the region as he built a strategic plan for this campus that still stands today. He's probably getting ready to dust it off and do <laughs> some work on it, but from that day forward, I really mean you and your senior team have always been out and about, and it's evidenced in both the research mm -hmm. and the, the education mission. So we're up at UMD all the time as an employer, elite, looking for accountants and uh, tax people and uh, economists and you know English majors, all the different things, engineers, we love the engineers they have up there. Mm -hmm. So that's the education mission, but also at places like NRI, we see opportunities to help really uh, tackle the sort of issues that a resource-based economy like Northeastern Minnesota has, mm -hmm. and nobody's better at that. And my, again, I'm a little biased. The university as a whole is a great research university, but we've got applied research going on up here that is really focused on so, wood and taconite and things like mm -hmm. that. So Dave, some of our viewers may not realize uh, who you are. What is the Board of Regents? That's a, that's a good question, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to visit a little bit about it. So the, the, the Board of Regents is vested with the responsibility for managing and governing um, from a policy basis uh, from top to bottom the University of Minnesota across the state. So that's five campuses. That is uh, research institutes like NRI up over the hill. It is research and outreach centers. It is, uh, it is hospitals, it's clinics, it's uh, the Duluth Family Medicine Practice Center down in, in East Hillside, it's all of that. Mm -hmm. And the Board of Regents is 12 people who uh, every odd year of the legislature, four of us are up for election and uh, we're elected by a joint convention of the legislature, which means the senators go into the house, which they only do to hear the governor once a year, and then they do a roll call vote, all 201 of them to select Regents and were selected by congressional district and their six-year terms. There's four at large, eight congressional districts, of course, and one of the at large regents is has to be a student at the time that they're elected. So it's a constantly evolving, growing board, and uh, for the most part, people usually don't serve more than two terms. But uh, it's a great opportunity to learn sure. and get engaged. How do you get on the radar for this? Is it something that, that you apply to become a, um, a member you, of the board or is some, are you nominated by somebody? You do apply and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll just mention in a lot of states governors pick and then senators confirm and in some states regents are direct elected and ours we use the legislature to do that. So in November of an even year there's a process to apply where they reach out, the Region Candidate Advisory Council reaches out and asks the state, you know, if you're interested in one of the seats that's open, and they vary every year, whether it's a congressional district or an at-large or some of both, then we you put applications in in November, the Region Candidate Council screens them, and then they go to the joint, mm -hmm. to the two committees of the House governs, charged with governing higher ed, so the House mm -hmm. higher ed, Senate higher yeah. ed, and you work your way up through a joint committee to this joint convention that occurred in February. Mm -hmm. Chancellor, we're a fourth of the way into 2017. Given where we stand now this year, what does UMD need specifically from the Board of Regents this year? Well, we always need their ongoing support and ag advocacy. Uh, since this is a biennial budget year, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeking funding to help support our core mission at UMD, uh, particularly around areas of student success. Uh, we're also continuing to look for support for facilities, both upgrades of facilities as well as new construction. Such as? Uh, such as. Our Romano Gymnasium is in a building that was built in the 1950s, uh, and uh, the uh, area is in sore need of a complete overhaul in terms of its uh, HVAC system. Uh, the floor of Romano Gymnasium is now buckling when it gets humid uh, because of a lack of good ventilation in that, in that space. And so that's an example of, of, a, of a renovation project that's critical because it's a health safety issue as well as being a comfort issue. On the new building side, uh, we have a proposal that's been in front of the legislature uh, for over a year now, the uh, Chemistry Advanced Materials Sciences Building is a new building that was a num it still is the number one new building priority for the University of Minnesota system. Unfortunately, since there was no bonding last year, it was not funded, and we're still waiting to see what's gonna happen this year. Mm -hmm. We're continuing to be advocates for that building. Uh, so it's, it's always a combination of, of new buildings, but also renovating buildings that are still good, 
but they're in, in dire need of, mm -hmm. of updating and repair. What are you hearing from the legislature right now in terms of the bonding bill? Do you think that there will be anything coming out of this session at all? Well, it's hard for me to predict. Mm -hmm. uh, we s continue to advocate and, and lobby for that, and next week we'll be down uh, with our colleagues in Duluth and St. Louis County uh, for S Duluth St. Louis County Day at the Capitol. Uh, so we, we continue to advocate, but I, uh, I, I just don't know what to say at this point. Uh, we're not hearing a lot of discussion about bonding, uh, and I, so I, I'm not sure. You may have more, more detailed information about that than I do, Dave. Well, I'm going to go and point out that Romano Gymnasium looks exactly t like it does today, <laughs> like it did when I walked across the stage to get my degree in 1983. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's in need of some help. But I, I think uh, the... the the, uh, both the House and Senate Republican caucuses came out with their targets this week, and the governor's targets were out earlier, and uh, that's on the budget side. We haven't really heard much of substance yet on bonding. I think they got to get a framework around the budget, and then they can talk about bonding, and then there's always transportation and a tax bill. So there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts, yeah. and they yeah. all got to move forward. I've heard all the leadership there talk about wanting to get things done this session, and all four of those are big items to get done, so it is tough to speculate. Dave, you piqued my interest a couple of minutes ago. Are there student representatives on the Board of Regents? There are. There are indeed, Denny, and uh, we heard from a couple of them today, including Duluth's own Mike Kenyana. So there is a student representative from each of the campuses, and then there's a graduate student representative, and am I missing any? And then there is the representative of the Board of Regents member you mentioned who yes, selected yeah. as a student. One of our members, and that's uh, Abdul Omari now, who was a graduate student at the time he was elected. So, and so what do get, they do with the board? They, get, they, they give us, I think, a very vital role of a, a current sense of, you know, it's great for us to talk about what students need or listen to what administration tells us students need. It's nothing's better than to listen to what mm -hmm. students who are students at this very time from both the graduate or professional and the undergraduate perspectives uh, need. And I am constantly in awe of these people, and I said so today at the meeting, that they add to their busy schedules of studying and working the role of participating in student governance and then sitting down with us every other month, if not mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. twice a month, to uh, engage. I looked at the agenda, and it looked like um, the student reps were giving their annual report to the the Board of Regents. What were some of those ideas that they brought forward as, as being really important to the student body that maybe you wouldn't see or, or would be coming from a different perspective? Well, I'll throw a couple out, uh, mm -hmm. Chancellor Black, and then maybe you want to add a couple too, but the two that, that resonated with me, and this isn't the first time we've heard it, but a real sensitivity around mental health issues affecting students, a lot of stresses mm -hmm. and pulls, and I remember that when I was an undergraduate mm -hmm. student. And uh, we need to be more sensitive to that, find ways to direct funding and resources there so that we can get students that kind of aid. Another one is really the push and pull around freedom of speech. And you know, campuses are traditionally a place where folks like to speak their mind. And in this political environment, there's, uh, there's, you know, there's more, more questioning right now. Is freedom of speech really a value? Not for the university, but for higher ed in general. And the students expressed, uh, a real strong interest in keeping that dialogue alive and well. They want to be heard, they want the opportunity to express themselves, but we've got a political climate that uh, some feel may make that more difficult. So that's a great thing about higher education. That's where discussions like that happen. Mm -hmm. Chancellor? Yeah, I, I would agree with those two. Uh, also, they expressed uh, concern and interest about resource issues coming to the various campuses, and, and there is a lot of concern about that right now. And, and uh, Regent McMillan mentioned earlier the uh, budgets coming out of the House and, and, and Senate proposed budgets for the states. And, and right now it, it looks kind of bleak, quite frankly, mm -hmm. for us. I'm concerned about what I'm hearing uh, regarding potential budgets from the House and Senate. Could that have an effect on upcoming tuitions? Uh, certainly could, yes. yes. Definitely could. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because mm -hmm. uh, our goal is to hold tuition steady again. We did not have a in tuition increase this year. and we, we've held it steady for, I believe, three of the last four years. We'd like to continue doing that, but if we are con to continue the focus on, as I mentioned earlier, our core mission of, of instruction and research and also to continue to focus on student success, we're going to have to have some assistance from the state in order to continue to hold tuition steady. All right. Well, that's about all the time we have. Chancellor Black, thank you very much for coming in. Thank Regent you. Dave McMillan, thank, thank you, you for coming in. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you.
Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Like Lake Superior itself, the shipping season is difficult to predict. Last spring, an ice jam clogged the harbor, keeping commerce at bay. This spring, it's not ice, but the recession that could pose a problem. The shipping season itself is pretty difficult to predict. There are so many outside factors that uh, take play on how the overall season ends up. Recent figures rank Duluth as our nation's 14th most profitable world port. Last season was a disappointing one for the Port Authority. Waterborne commerce was down 5.4 percent, but the outlook is more optimistic for the 1992 season. Barring any surprises, the port can expect a 2.8 percent increase with a total 36 million metric tons of trade. What we do is uh, attempt to make sure that everyone is aware that Duluth is here, that's involved in maritime commerce, do everything that we can to attract any possible business that comes through the port. Last fall, the harbor had its first visit by a roll-on, roll-off Russian vessel. The authority hopes to see more Baltic ships in our port following the breakup of the Soviet Union. History was made last fall when the first Native American was named to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Justice Ann McKeague has northern Minnesota ties and represents the 4th Judicial District. This week we have a video feature on Judge McKeague produced by WDSE's Native Report. Reporter Tad Johnson interviewed the judge about her road to the state's top court. Family, friends, and colleagues of the Honorable Anne McKeague filled O'Shaughnessy Auditorium on the campus of St. Catherine University to bear witness to an historic moment in the history of Minnesota, the swearing-in of the first Native American jurist on the state's highest court. As a young girl from northern Minnesota, Judge McKeague aspired to become a lawyer. Well, I was going to be a dentist, and I had to do a report on dentistry and there was a lot of science. And I knew that I did not like science, and I was not good at science. And I think I decided that I was good at arguing and also liked helping people. I think that comes from my parents. And for some reason, I, don't, I can't really understand why, because I didn't know any lawyers. Um, I don't know if it was Hill Street Blues that was probably on TV at the time, but I just decided I'm going to be a lawyer and I think it was probably destined from the day I was born that I was going to go to St. Catharines University where my mother attended. I was the only girl and so that was the plan and I never changed that plan. I think I was lucky. I had the best of both worlds. I had a mother who was a Fulbright scholar and valued education and saw the importance of that, saw the importance of her role within the community. You know, she certainly could have done a million other things in her lifetime. She was from Bemidji, and she chose to move back home for the welfare of her kids to raise them in a small town uh, and give up her dreams and aspirations, which were much bigger than that. And then my dad, who was born in Onagam and who hated the Twin Cities and hated traffic and just couldn't function down here. And so he was home when he went you know, back to Federal Dam. But he valued, you know, if you can't get your hands dirty and you can't do physical labor, then education means nothing. So you take those two things together, and I couldn't have been luckier in knowing that you got to be part of the community. What can you do to help the community? But also, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty, because a good day's work is good for everybody. After receiving her law degree from Hamlin University, Judge McKeague's first law job was with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office in the Child Protection Division, specializing in Indian child welfare cases. Mike Freeman hired me in 1992, and I was placed as a law clerk in the Child Protection Division, and it was as though I landed home and I stayed there until I left in 2008. I knew I wanted to be a mother, 
I knew I wanted to have a lot of children. And so when I could have an impact on kids in a positive way, I think that's probably what was most um, rewarding about that job. But then I was fortunate enough, uh, Mike Freeman approached me in, I wanna say in the later 90s, if I wanted to work on improving the office's work with the tribes and specifically on the Indian child welfare cases. And that was something that really interested me because of course it was gonna bring me home and it was gonna allow me to do work within my community. And so I, I along with another county attorney, Murney Haney at the time, he allowed us to travel throughout the state of Minnesota as well as the Dakotas and meet with all of the reservations with which we had children in common. Hennepin was like the third largest urban Indian population at the time and we had a very large number of those cases. And to really start a discussion and to listen about what we could do different as a government agency and involving the tribes in those um, proceedings. For example, I can recall going out to um, Rosebud and Pine, Rib Pine Ridge in particular, and the Rosebud rep said, you are the first county attorney that has ever come to our reservation in all of the years that we've been doing child welfare cases from anywhere. And how sad is that with a law that was passed in 1978 and this is the late 90s. And so that really told me how important this was. With her appointment to the state Supreme Court by Governor Mark Dayton, Judge McKeague reflects on a special person who influenced her throughout her legal career. And she in turn offers advice to the younger generation. I had gone in 1995 to, there was a swearing in of Robert Blazer. And I had heard about this guy who was a White Earth member. I am from White Earth, um, even though I grew up in Federal Dam. And watching him be sworn in, I think instilled in me, okay, if this guy can do it from the White Earth Reservation, then maybe I could too. And he really took me under his wing and mentored me. He was a very big inspiration. I tell my kids and I tell the law clerks and um, the students that I teach, I said, never say no to yourself. Make somebody say no to you. Meaning that you can do whatever it is that you wanna do. I mean, I am a perfect example of that. I grew up in a town of 100 people. I wasn't exposed to there wasn't any lawyers like that I knew of in town that were around me. But still, a dream was born, and I followed that dream. And it was, every door is open to me until somebody closes it. And even if they close it, I'm going to keep going to try to open it. And that's, I think, you have to have that sort of ambition and belief in yourself and seek out the mentorship of others because I now view that I have a responsibility to pass on what I have learned and what I have gained from Judge Blazer, as well as other people who have mentored me. And I think it's really important to seek that out as a young person and have others help you find your way because it's too big to do by yourself. Time now for the week's top business stories from Business North. Sandy Hoff and Alex Giuliani, who developed the Pier B project last year in Duluth, have been selected as the team to refurbish the adjacent Lot D. It's the last undeveloped non-industrial parcel along the Duluth Harbor and is owned by the Duluth Economic Development Authority. The 12-acre parcel has 1,500 feet of lake frontage and is zoned mixed-use waterfront. DITA is requiring the team to construct commercial space and 80 units of market rate housing on the land. They must also clean up pollution left by previous industrial users. Well, a fight has developed between Minshew supporters and Minnesota Republicans who want to replace the insurance exchange with the federal version. 
A week ago in Duluth, Minshur's CEO said her agency increased health insurance enrollment by 96 percent since its inception four years ago and said Republican insurance initiatives will increase premiums but not reduce deductibles. But State Representative Greg Davids has labeled Minshur the biggest disaster in Minnesota history and has proposed a plan to reinsure health insurance companies against potential losses. Governor Mark Dayton said he won't support that initiative unless insurers submit their coverage plans. Supporters and opponents of non-ferrous mining reiterated their beliefs about renewing mineral leases at a hearing last week hosted by the U.S. Forest Service. The leases have been held since the 1960s by Twin Metals Minnesota and its predecessors, which have invested $400 million into exploration. Renewal was denied last year by Governor Dayton and the federal agencies. In two hours of testimony, the discussions remained a jobs versus environment issue. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment about our show this week, now's the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org. And don't forget the WDSC website when you're looking for the latest program information, updates on station events, and other news from public TV. And finally tonight, we leave you with some video shot this week as shipping traffic resumed in the Twin Ports Harbor. The Roger Blau was first out of the harbor early Wednesday on his way to two harbors to load iron ore. Our video was shot on Thursday as other vessels made their first journeys of the 2017 shipping season. With virtually ice-free conditions across the Great Lakes, a quick start to the season is expected. The Sioux Locks open on Saturday, which means the Twin Ports could see its first arrival of the season sometime on Sunday. The Stuart J. Court, James R. Barker, and the Cason J. Calloway are all due into port early next week. Great to see these big vessels moving once again on the big lake. For Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.